People have often said to me that wokeness is creeping into the church as if it's infiltrating the church stealthily or clandestinely. That's not what's happening. Wokeness isn't creeping into the church. Wokeness is being let into the church right through the front door. As increasing numbers of woke pastors and woke elders and woke deacons and woke worship leaders and woke Sunday school teachers and woke lay people and woke seminary professors and woke parachurch ministry heads who have embraced the demonic lie that Christ's church is merely a social institution are placed into positions of leadership and authority. I want to speak with you this morning on the topic of the spiritual deception of wokeness. Now, that's the front end of the title of my message, but the back end of the title is just as important. The subtitle is A Postmortem on the Effects of Wokeness in the Church. A Postmortem on the Effects of Wokeness in the Church. Now, the term postmortem is a Latin word meaning after death. Postmortem literally means after death. The word post meaning after, the word mortem meaning death. And during a postmortem, a pathologist will examine the outside of the body and then open the body to examine the organs. The pathologist may also take tissue samples and in some cases remove organs from the body for more detailed examination in order to establish a cause of death. Now, though I feel safe in assuming that every person in this room probably knew that already, I thought it both important and necessary to begin my message with that definition as I endeavor to put some context around what it is I want to share with you in the brief time we have together this morning. Though Christ's church is not dead, nor can it die, since its founder and head is immortal and eternal, that's 1 Timothy 1.17, there is a sense in that there is no need to conduct a post-mortem on the church. Nevertheless, there is a sense in which it has become necessary, in my opinion, to conduct an examination of the spiritual health and vitality of the evangelical church in light of the extent to which the putrid ideological disease that is wokeness has infected and contaminated it. But before we look at some of the specific ways in which wokeness has, in fact, infected the church, it's important, as we did earlier with the term postmortem, to provide some context around the idea of wokeness by first attempting to define it. So what does the term wokeness mean? What does it even entail? Now, I'll endeavor to answer that question in a moment. But what I want to put before you at the outset of my message is that a predecessor question that we need to consider is this. Why should it matter to the church what wokeness means? I mean, after all, isn't wokeness something that's a problem out there somewhere? In other words, and with sincerest apologies to the late Tina Turner, what does the church have to do with wokeness? What does the church have to do with it? I mean, people have often said to me that wokeness is creeping into the church as if it's infiltrating the church stealthily or clandestinely. No, my brothers and sisters, that's not what's happening. Wokeness isn't creeping into the church. Wokeness is being let let into the church right through the front door. Wokeness is an ideological Trojan horse without the horse. You don't need a horse when you consider, as John MacArthur says in his book, Christ's Call to Reform the Church, that, quote, churches today are so invested in attracting sinners that they attempt to bury their theology under the welcome mat. That unbiblical model of outreach is the very thing dulling many churches' ability to reach the world with the gospel. Filling the pews with comfortable, unaffected unbelievers is the fastest way to confuse and corrupt the work of the church. God has not called his people out of the world to chase its trends in vain attempts to seem relevant. 
The church cannot be salt and light in this wretched world if we are indistinguishable from worldly people, unquote. So when it comes to defining wokeness, it's important that we not treat that word as merely an innocuous form of sociocultural slang. I say that in light of the following comment from comedian and self-described multi-hyphenate and social justice advocate Amanda Seals, who in an episode of her podcast called Small Doses with Amanda Seals said this, quote, wokeness for what it's worth is a buzzword that a lot of people are not truly understanding the depths of. I think sometimes things work their way into the zeitgeist and they lose their weight. And wokeness is one of those words that has reached that point, unquote. I completely agree with Amanda Seals, by the way. Wokeness is one of those words that as it relates to the evangelical church, we fail to really grasp the significance of. So with those words from Amanda Seals' background, let's consider the question, what exactly is wokeness to begin with? It may surprise you to learn that there is really no single objective settled upon definition of that word. For example, in a tweet dated December 10th, 2022, Joy Ann Reed, host of the MSNBC program The Readout, said this, quote, being woke progressive means being awake to the suffering and oppression of others and open and enthusiastic about modernity and change. It means being better than you were. For us, that is for woke progressives, Change is joyful and liberating. I'd much rather be us than miserable them, unquote. Reed's rather antagonistic construct of wokeness stands in stark contrast to a more objective definition provided by Dr. Owen Strayan, who defines wokeness as this, quote, wokeness is first and foremost a mindset and a posture born of critical race theory and related systems of thought. The term itself means that one is awake to the true nature of our society where so many fail to see it. In the most specific sense, this means one sees the comprehensive inequity of our social order and the corresponding need for racial and social justice." Unquote. Now a third take on defining wokeness is from media producer Robbie Starbuck, who is even more direct than either Reed or Strand. Starbucks says about wokeness, quote, that it is a multifaceted pseudo-religion complete with strictly enforced virtues, internet inquisitions, sins, penance, public rituals, evangel evangelization, iconoclasm, sacred texts, seminaries, and more. It is a modern leftist cult, unquote. You see, the truth is there are elements of each of those three perspectives from which we could develop an objective construct of what wokeness is. And though the term wokeness is regarded by many within evangelicalism as a benign colloquialism, it is in reality a one-word dialectical repository for such worldly philosophies and ideologies as social justice, anti-racism, critical race theory, intersectionality, cultural Marxism, liberation theology, womanist theology, reproductive justice, otherwise abortion, scientific justice, ethnic studies, gender theory, queer theory, drag theory, transhumanism, posthumanism, DEI, that is diversity, equity, and inclusion, SEL, social and emotional learning, ESG, environmental, social, and governance, and the latest addition to that ever-expanding panoply of cultural suppositions, climate change, or what in contemporary woke vernacular is commonly referred to as environmental justice or environmental racism. All those things fall under the umbrella of that one word, wokeness. Speaking of environmental racism, you knew I wasn't going to leave that alone. 
Speaking of environmental racism, the noted theologian and biblical apologist Jane Fonda offered the following commentary recently in an episode of The Kel Kelly Clarkson Show, where she said this, quote, I'm quoting here. Well, you know, you can take anything. Sexism, racism, misogyny, homophobia, whatever, the war. And if you really get into it and study it and learn about it and the history of it and everything's connected, there'd be no climate crisis if it wasn't for racism, unquote. Jane Fonda said, there'd be no climate crisis if it wasn't for racism, unquote. You see, that comment by Jane Fonda is one of the most inane examples you'll come across of how wokeness is essentially an onto ontological abyss. It's a philosophical black hole that sucks every social, political, cultural, and yes, theological and ecclesiastical issue into it that the ideologies I noted earlier can each be suborned under the broader canopy of wokeness is a commentary on the fact that wokeness is essentially another form of postmodernism. The Stanford University Encyclopedia of Philosophy defines postmodernism as a set of critical, strategic, and rhetorical practices employing concepts that are specifically designed, listen to this, concepts that are specifically designed to destabilize and deconstruct other concepts. Do not forget that. Postmodernism by design seeks to deconstruct and destabilize other concepts. You see, the key word in that definition of postmodernism is the word critical, which means to criticize, which is subjective. It does not mean to analyze which is objective. In wokeness, literally everything is criticized and must be criticized. It must be criticized if it is to be destabilized and deconstructed, which is ultimately the goal of wokeness. Wokeness is a scorched earth worldview from which absolutely nothing is safe. Nothing. It must criticize everything, literally. One non-ecclesiastical example of this is from an, an article titled, Humanity is Doomed If We Let Woke Zealots Destroy Scientific Truth. Now remember I said earlier that wokeness is designed as an element of postmodernism to deconstruct and destabilize other concepts. In this article, which was published March 4th, 2023, on the website of the British media outlet, The Telegraph, Journalist Zoe Strimple makes the following observation. Listen to this closely, please. I'm quoting. American universities devote pages and pages to the apparent new job of science to be anti-racist. In 2021, notoriously, Ivy League students at Cornell University were offered a course titled Black Holes, Race, and the Cosmos which gave students the chance to mull the following, quote, conventional wisdom would have it that the black in black holes has nothing to do with race. Surely there can be no connection between the cosmos and the idea of racial blackness. Can there? Contemporary black studies theorists, artists, and fiction writers implicitly and explicitly posit just such a connection. So now the term black holes is racist. <laughs> Nothing is exempt from wokeness. Nothing. Strimple continues. So the postmodern mockery of truth that underpins wokeness is now extending well beyond the humanities into areas that until about five minutes ago have been spared but a world in which it is not only possible, but actively encouraged to strip science of its epistemological integrity, the quest for what is true and what is possible, and to treat it as though it were merely yet another discussion of people's feelings, 
or a political platform from, for condemning racism and transphobia is a world that is not destined to last very long, unquote. Wokeness fits perfectly within that definition of postmodernism that I cited earlier because among the myriad concepts it is fundamentally designed to destabilize and deconstruct is the concept of absolute truth. This is why now a man is not a man. A woman is not a, mo a woman. When you have a Supreme Court nominee in Ketanji Brown Jackson, who sits before the Senate Confirmation Committee and can't, not, not, not cannot, she will not affirm what is a woman. This is deconstructionism. Kichanji Brown Jackson is woke. Postmodernism, which is what wokeness is, makes wokeness a self-enslaving worldview when you stop and think about it. For by not accepting anything as being objectively right or wrong, by not accepting anything as being objectively right or wrong, wokeness subjugates its followers to the philosophical bondage of a capricious and ever-shifting paradigm of not only what is or isn't right, but what is or isn't righteous what is or isn't righteous with regard to morals and ethics. That is why in many ways, wokeness is not merely an ideological or philosophical proposition, but is a holy religious framework, W-H-O-L-L-Y. It is a holy religious framework as well, complete with its own theology, its own homardiology, and its own soteriology. And when, you, when, you, when your professed worldview contains those three elements. When your professed worldview contains a theology that is a doctrine of God, a hardiology that is a doctrine of sin, and a soteriology that is a doctrine of salvation, what you have, you have not only followers at that point, you've got disciples. You see, and when you have disciples, you have a religion. You have evangelists. Wokeness is a religion. It has its own disciples, and wokeness endeavors to, to uh, turn those disciples into evangelists. So make no mistake, wokeness is discipleship evangelism. Wokeness is discipleship evangelism. But as it specifically relates to the spiritual deceptiveness of wokeness and how that worldview is infecting the evangelical church in terms of both orthodoxy and orthopraxy, I want to suggest to you today that at its most fundamental level, Wokeness is a man-centered approach to widening the narrow road to God. I say that in light of what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. As wokeness, with all its deceptive principles, precepts, and tenets, continues to be embraced and affirmed within the evangelical church, often with the willing cooperation and facilitation of its leaders, I want to suggest to you that the effects of such ideological accommodation can best be observed primarily, though perhaps not exclusively, primarily in the following two ways. One, theological relativism, and two, ethnic tribalism. Theological relativism and ethnic tribalism. First, as theological relativism. A prime example of how wokeness leads to theological relativism is Dr. Randy Woodley. Randy, are you here? Great, I can proceed. <clears throat> A prime example of how wokeness uh, evidences itself in theological relativism is Dr. Randy Woodley. Dr. Woodley is Distinguished Professor of Faith and Culture and Director of Intercultural and Indigenous Studies at Portland Seminary. Now you knew I was going to refer to a liberal seminary just by that title. That's a multi-word title right there. 
Portland Seminary, which is located at George Fox University in Newburgh, Oregon. When, now listen, I need you to listen closely here. When asked by a white female, we're talking about theological relativism. When asked by a white female student how she could better understand the concept of decolonizing evangelical missions, Dr. Woodley responded as follows. And again, before I quote Dr. Woodley, please understand that what you're about to hear, I'm quoting verbatim. We're talking about wokeness as theological relativism. Dr. Woodley, in response to that question to that uh, student of his who happened to be a white female on how can she deconstruct evangelicalism, he responded thusly, quote, our job is first to observe where Jesus is active, whether it's your next door neighbor or someone across the waters. It doesn't matter. Where is Jesus, a Jesus active? And once you find out where Jesus is active, then to convert to that in that culture. Because our job as humble servants of Christ is to first convert to their truth, not to expect them to convert to ours. Hold it, you haven't heard anything yet. <laughs> I'm continuing to quote Dr. Woodley. And to understand that God expects two conversions out of every process. And when I'm saying conversion, it's little c. Like, I look at salvation to me, number one, red flag. When anyone personalizes what evangelism is, when they say, well, to me, or, or I feel, or I think, red flag, run. <laughs> to me, a word that better captures salvation is healing. And healing is a process. We begin our healing, Dr. Whitley says. We complete our healing, but we are also being healed. So as Paul says, now we are much closer now to our own salvation or healing than when we first began. And then part of that is decolonizing our own thinking. And as much as possible, through the help of cultural guides, indigenizing ourselves to that culture, and then at the proper time when given permission to share our truth. And that's sort of how I understand mission and evangelism, unquote. When given permission, we look to the help of cultural guides, not to the scripture, to cultural guides. We convert first to their truth. Then when they give us permission, listen, Dr. Whitley, if you're converting to their truth, they've evangelized you. You're not gonna evangelize them. You've been evangelized. Why would they give you permission to share your truth at that point? Would you see that rather capitulative and acquiescent response from Dr. Woodley is repeat, replete rather with the language of theological relativism. But you see, that's precisely where the deception of wokeness leads. It leads you to a place, as Dr. Stephen Lawson has often said, where your feet are firmly planted in midair. That's because wokeness fundamentally is a worldview in which, as John MacArthur comments in his book, The Truth War, quote, objectivity is an illusion. This is what Dr. Willie didn't get. Objectivity is illusion, is an illusion. Nothing is certain. And the thoughtful person will never speak with too much conviction about anything. See, this is where wokeness wants you to be, especially as it relates to theological relativism. The theological relativist, relativist can, will never speak with too much conviction. They're always apologizing for conveying to you what they believe. Oh, I'm sorry, please forgive me. This is exactly what John MacArthur is saying. The theological relativist will never speak with too much conviction about anything. Strong convictions about any point of truth are judged supremely arrogant and hopelessly naive. Everyone is entitled to his own truth, unquote. This is exactly where Dr. Woodley is. His feet are firmly planted in midair. 
Indeed, in wokeness, objectivity is merely an illusion, a mirage. It's a phantasm. That wokeness views objectivity as illusory is precisely why people like Dr. Randy Whitley, Randy Whitley are so evasive and noncommittal when it comes to defending the biblical gospel. He doesn't believe it. You're not going to defend what you don't believe. Dr. Woodley does not believe the Bible. And when I say biblical gospel, I'm speaking of the gospel which in Colossians 2.8 calls us to no longer be taken captive by philosophy or empty deception according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of, war, of the world, rather than according to Christ. This is why you're here today. Colossians 2.8 is why you're here. You refuse by your presence here to be captivated by philosophy and empty deception. That's why you're here. Perhaps Dr. Woodley's relativistic visage of evangelicalism can be better understood when considered against the backdrop of Portland Seminary's rather woke statement of faith, which reads as follows, quote, we believe that God has called us to be and to make disciples of Jesus Christ. No problem so far. But see, there's a so far. <laughs> we believe that God has called us to be and to make disciples of Jesus Christ and to be God's agents of love and reconciliation in the world. In keeping with the teaching of Jesus, we work to oppose violence and war, and we seek peace and justice in human relationships and social structures." Unquote. Now that statement may seem harmless enough on the surface, but it is abounding with woke euphemisms, phrases like social structures and peace and justice and agents of love and reconciliation are merely woke verbalisms commonly employed by professing evangelicals who sanctimoniously consider themselves to be theologically and ecclesiastically progressive and who attend churches that have Black Lives Matter banners and pride rainbow flags conspicuously displayed as woke virtue symbols pointing hell-bound sinners to a postmodern Golgotha. Have you seen these churches? You realize, right, within Protestant evangelicalism, more so on the liberal side of Protestant evangelicalism, these pride flags are replacing crosses. You won't see crosses anymore in these pulpits. You got BLM flags and pride flags replacing crosses. This is what I mean when I say those symbols, BLM and the pride flags, are the postmodern evangelist, evangelist way to point hell-bound sinners to a postmodern Golgotha. Golgotha is where Christ was crucified. But in wokeness and postmodernism, in postmodernist evangelicalism, the flag now is where you come. Not for forgiveness because there's no sin in wokeness. You can live however you want as long as you love one another. But see, Dr. Woodley isn't alone in his theological capitulation to the culture. Listen to what Andy Stanley. See, I don't mind name dropping because <laughs> listen to what Andy Stanley, senior pastor at North Point Community Church in my hometown, Atlanta, Georgia, said recently concerning the value in his view that practice, practicing LGBTQ now, practicing LGBTQ men and women bring to the evangelical church. Stanley said this, quote, if I can figure out how to get straight people as excited about serving and engaging as the gay men and women I know, we would have a volunteer backlog. That's my experience in our churches. A gay person who still wants to attend church after the way the church has treated the gay community, I'm telling you, they have more faith than I do. They have more faith than a lot of you. 
I know 1 Corinthians 6, and I know Leviticus, and I know Romans 1, and it's so interesting to talk about all that stuff, but a gay man or woman who wants to worship their heavenly father, who did not answer the cry of their heart when they were 12 and 13 and 14 and 15, God said no, and they still love God. Now, let me pause here. What, he's, what Stanley's alluding to here is that that 12, 13, 14, and 15-year-old pleaded with God to change them from being gay, and God said no. You see what he's doing here? This isn't in my notes. I'm giving you this for free. <clears throat> what Stanley is doing, he's giving you a very subtle apologetic that points to the rationale that they were born that way. God said no. Not going to change you. God said no, and they still love God. Is that a bug? God said no, and they still love God. We have some things to learn from a group of men and women who love Jesus that much and who want to worship with us. And I know the verses, I know the passages, but we got to figure this out, unquote. He says he knows the verses and he knows the passages, but he just still says we got to figure this out. Well, Romans 1 already figured this out. You see what both Dr. Woodley and Andy Stanley are demonstrating, respectively, is that in wokeness, you see, the church is merely a social construct. And what do I mean by social construct? Well, consider that question in light of a 2003 white paper titled, Through a Mirror Dimly, subtitled, Sub Social Constructionism Through the Lens of Faith, written by Dr. Amy Quillen. Dr. Quillen is student ombuds and Director of Academic Engagements and Partnerships at Kent State University's Division of, Division of Student Affairs. In the aforementioned white paper, Dr. Quillen outlines five philosophical components that are inherent to the idea of social constructionism. And as I quote Dr. Quillen, please listen very closely to see if you recognize in any of the components she outlines as being present in one form or another in the statements I read earlier from both Dr. Randy Woodley and Andy Stanley. Before I quote Dr. Quinn, let me just say this, that Stanley and Woodley view the church as merely a social construct. What I mean by that is that they view the church merely as a place to come together, to commune with one another in sort of neighborly friendship and camaraderie. No doctrine is taught, no scripture is given, and if it is given, it's misinterpreted. The hermeneutic is totally twisted. It's just where you come and you fellowship with one another as you are. No repentance, no confession, no change. Because again, as I said earlier, there's no sin. Dr. Quillen said this. This is how she, I, I think it's a brilliant definition of what social constructionism is. She says, quote, social constructionism purports that our beliefs ways of thinking and values are not inherently, innately, or objectively given. So in this case, objective truth is not given by God. But rather, our beliefs are constructed within the framework of social interaction with others. Social constructionism suggests that A, reality cannot be objectively known, and if you believe that, you're in the wrong place. Let me just say that. Social constructionism suggests that A, reality cannot be objectively known. B, reality is constructed in the course of dialogue with others through the use of language contextually formulated and mutually understood. That's what Dr. Woodley was arguing. We must convert to these other truths. C, reality manifests itself through narrative D, the culture in which we live both shapes and is shaped by our realities. E, the concept of self and human nature is not a universal one, but is stipulated by the culture in which the individuals find themselves. Let me pause there. That's why the transgender movement is making the progress that it's making right now. Because we've adopted the idea of subjective feelings as reality. I've got another message that I, that I preached titled, Living by Truth in a World of Lies, 
where I lay all of this out. The entire transgenderism movement is a movement where the culture is not challenging these people on how they're feeling. It's all about how, you, well, if you feel like you're trapped in the wrong body, then guess what? You're in the wrong body and you need to fix that. Continuing to quote Dr. Quillen, the concept of self and human nature is not a universal one, but is stipulated by the culture in which the individuals find themselves. In other words, truth is not objective. And then F, the culture itself often marginalizes its people groups with its creations of categories and so-called truths, unquote. So when you exegete both Whitley's and Stanley's remarks closely, you'll find evidence of all five components of Dr. Quillen's definition of social constructionism. Transgender, gender theory, gender dysphoria is not real. This is a lie that the culture is feeding these image bearers of God because they've rejected the idea of absolute truth. There's no such thing as male and female, man and woman. But you see, social constructionism is precisely how wokeness invades and becomes operative in the church as increasing numbers of woke pastors and woke elders and woke deacons and woke worship leaders and woke Sunday school teachers and woke lay people and woke seminary professors and woke parachurch ministry heads who have embraced the demonic lie that Christ's church is merely a social institution are placed in the positions of leadership and authority. That's how wokeness invades the church. Like I said earlier, it's a Trojan horse without the horse. I don't mean to be offensive here, but some of you who are, who are pastors, see, you're hiring people instead of calling them. You're hiring some of these people. You see, when the leaders of those churches and the institutions embrace wokeness, theological relativism is and should be the expected result. The consequences of which is that the theological and spiritual direction of those institutions ends up being shaped by cowardly men who are unwilling to pay the cost of standing for the truth, if they were ever willing to stand for the truth at all, for fear of losing the attention, admiration, and acceptance they so desperately crave, not only from the world, but from worldly Christians who are in the church. They're cowards. because they want the attention of the world. Who cares how large your role of membership is if they're going to hell? You see, it's with that unfortunate reality in mind that I wholeheartedly concur with Pastor John MacArthur, who in a 2019 interview on the topic of why churches languish under cowardly pastors, said this, quote, there's nothing worse than a pastor who doesn't have any convictions. And when I say convictions, I mean convictions about the things that are laid out explicitly in Scripture. If you will compromise what the Bible says, you're the worst substitute for a pastor. We, of all people, must take what the Word of God says. It must become part of our conviction to such a degree that we will earnestly contend for the faith, that we will fight for the faith, that we will boldly proclaim the faith, even if it means death." Unquote. Needless to say, the church is not a social construct, far from it. As the 19th century Scottish Puritan James Bannerman reminds us in his classic book titled The Church of Christ, quote, the church is a divine institution while all others around it are human. It is a city whose builder and maker is God while all other societies have been created by man. And the Christian society, thus founded and maintained by God in the midst of a world where all around is human and earthly, must have been established for no trivial or ordinary end." Unquote. See, that's what Andy Stanley doesn't get. Andy Stanley sees the church as trivial. It's just ordinary. He doesn't see it as a divine institution.
You see, but not only does wokeness lead to theological relativism, it also results in ethnic tribalism. Ethnic tribalism. On March 9, 2018, the New York Times published an article titled, A Quiet Exodus, subtitled, Why Black Worshippers Are Leaving White Evangelical Churches. The article highlights a group of black Christians who formerly were members of churches with predominantly white congregations, but who were personally grieving the fact that their white pastors were not using their pulpits as woke soapboxes to pontificate about racial reconciliation and social justice. Consequently, those individuals engaged in what the article termed a, quote, quiet exodus, unquote, from those churches and subsequently began seeking out churches where they would feel more valued and appreciated for who they are as black Christians, unlike those to which they formerly belonged that had simply failed to realize how incredibly blessed they were to have them as black Christians as members of their congregations. Yeah, I'm being facetious. It's, it's absurd. You see, but that kind of self-exalting hubris is reflected in this comment by Dr. Shaniqua Walker Barnes, who in that New York Times article lamented, quote, we, black Christians, were willing to give up our preferred worship style for the chance to really try to live this vision of beloved community with a diverse group of people, but that didn't work, unquote. Now, that comment by Dr. Walker Barnes is an example of what I would describe as a kind of woke semi-Pelagianism. Semi-Pelagianism teaches that the whole of humanity is tainted by sin, but not to the extent that we cannot cooperate with God's grace on our own. In woke semi-Pelagianism, black Christians acknowledge that they are tainted by sin, yes, but not to the same degree or extent that white Christians are. Consequently, black Christians, only because they're black, are viewed as spiritually superior to their white brothers and sisters. This is what Dr. Shaniqua Walker Barnes was arguing. Hey, we tried to make it work, but because of them, it didn't work. That's because in wokeness, you see, this is what you must grasp as it relates to ethnic tribalism. In wokeness, melanin is an indication of sanctification. See, if you guys have listened to the Just Think It podcast, you understand, I don't care. I don't care what kind of heat I'm going to get from this message. I really don't care. This is the truth, and you need to hear this. As it relates to ethnic tribalism, wokeness views melanin in terms of sanctification. What I mean by that is that the darker your skin color, the more holy you are which places the onus on those with less melanin to demonstrate and prove their probity, their rectitude to those who have more melanin. So when Dr. Walker Barnes bemoans that her ecclesiastical diversity experiment didn't work, what she's actually implying is that her fellow black congregants wanted, to, wanted it to succeed, but her white congregants didn't. Like most woke Christians, Walker Barnes's problem wasn't that the church she attended was multi-ethnic, but that it wasn't multicolored. In other words, her problem was that there weren't enough people who looked like me, and there were too many people who looked like you. See, there's a difference between multi-ethnic and multicolored. So whenever someone tells you, someone, you hear someone talk about, well, I think the church should be multi-ethnic. First of all, every true biblical church is already multi-ethnic. But when they use that term, what they really mean is multicolored. Don't miss that. They want more brown and black faces and fewer pink faces. There's no such thing as white. I'm going to deal with that later, so sit tight. <laughs> so that's Dr. Shamika Walker Barnes. Now, fast forward three, three years to 2021 and enter onto the scene self-described religion and race historian, Dr. Jamar Tisby, and his Lead Loud, Leave Loud initiative, which is the antithesis of the quiet exodus. So you have one extreme, you got the quiet exodus. The other extreme, you got the Leave Loud. 
In the notes from the March 8th, 2021 episode of Jamar Tisby's Pass the Mic podcast are these comments, quote, in recent months, we've seen a surge of black leaders and congregants in predominantly white or multi-ethnic churches and Christian spaces decide that it's time for them to go. We bear witness to the hurt, harm, and frustration that our siblings have experienced. Enough is enough. It's time to hashtag leave loud. To hashtag leave loud is to tell our stories, to name things for what they are, to take back the dignity we've lost while being in institutions that don't value the fullness of the image of God within us, and to go where we are celebrated and not just tolerated, unquote. So what you heard there in a nutshell is that Jamar Tisby believes that the church is all about him. The personal pronouns, we need to go where we are celebrated. We need to take back the dignity we've lost being in institutions that don't value us. The hashtag Leave Loud movement is an, exec, is an excellent example of ethnic tribalism as woke orthopraxy. But where does the orthodoxy that undergirds that kind of orthopraxy come from? Well, it comes from Tisby himself. In response to the question, when is it time to leave loud, Tisby, in a Facebook watch video dated March 15, 2021, said, quote, if we, that is black Christians, if we don't leave, we actually enable the toxic culture that we struggle so mightily against. If there are no consequences for an organization remaining stuck in racial recalcitrance, how will it ever change? Let me pause right here. You see, so in ethnic tribalism, woke, this is what I meant by uh, sort of interpreting uh, ethnic tribalism through the lens of woke semi-Pelagianism, because what Tisby is saying here is a prime example that in woke semi-Pelagianism, only white people are sinners. Black people never sin, because this makes me holy. See, I'm blessed by the, how much melanin I have. This is exactly what Tisby is saying. No, I'm, I'm sinless. I'm good to go. It's these white people over here that are the problem. If we black Christians don't leave, we actually enable the toxic culture that we struggle so mightily against. If there are no consequences for an organization remaining stuck in racial recalcitrance, how will it ever change? I'm not saying that this is a magic bullet, he says, but if people of color leave, if black people leave, maybe that will send a message, unquote. Now I have to say at this point that I'm constantly amazed at professing Christians who somehow feel entitled to display such prideful arrogance as that about a literally skin-deep attribute of their personhood, which they had absolutely nothing to do with. Nothing. Here is Tisby boasting in his blackness, boasting in his skin color, and he had nothing to do with that. That's what makes this so stupid. Perhaps in Tisby, Tisby's case, the rolls of potter and clay of which the prophet Isaiah speaks about in Isaiah 64, 8, have somehow been reversed. Perhaps now, Tisby's the potter. I made myself this way all of a sudden. He's not the clay anymore in God's hands. He's the potter. But you see, again, that is what wokeness begets. It begets a view of the church as seen through the lens of ethnic partiality and privilege so that the church is treated as if it were an ecclesiastical arm of the NAACP, whose sole purpose is to accommodate the cultural worship preference, preferences and predilections of black Christians who think the church exists to glorify them as opposed to existing to glorify Christ. And if any of those preferences are not accommodated, then of course, it can only be because that church is racist. This is what Tisby is putting forth. Speaking of race, I told you I was going to get here. Speaking of race, Acts chapter 17, verse 26. Acts 17, 26 provides a one-verse apologetic 
against the unbiblical and unscientific idea that there is such a thing as human races. One verse. That verse reads in the New American Standard, and he, that is God, made from one man, Adam, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Now, the word nation in Acts 17, 26 is not speaking of geographic sovereign national boundaries. That word nation in Acts 17, 26 is the Greek noun ethnos from which we get our English word ethnicity. So the proper word for Christians is not race. It's ethnicity. Ethnicity not race. Question, pop quiz, let's have a little fun. How many, with, with Acts 17, 26 in mind, how many of you have ever eaten at a restaurant that specialized in racial cuisine? <laughs> I rest my case. I rest my case. How many of you have ever prepared a meal following a recipe that came from a racial cookbook? <laughs> a cookbook of racial recipes. You see, the correct answer is none. You get that. You get that. The correct answer is none. You've never eaten. There's not a person in this building today who has ever eaten at a restaurant that specializes in racial cuisine nor have, has anyone ever prepared a meal from a cookbook of racial recipes. But you probably have eaten at a restaurant that specialized in ethnic cuisines. You probably have likely had a meal prepared for you from a cookbook of ethnic recipes. Now, why is that distinction important? It's important because there's no such thing as biological human race or for that matter, race says. Consider that against what Scripture teaches in James chapter 3, verse 7, which reads, For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. So someone will say to me, well, there are the word race appears in the Bible. Yeah, it does appear in the Bible. But see, here's where hermeneutics comes in. You can't just read a text without interpreting it. The word race in James 3, 7 is, the, is not the Greek noun ethnos. It's the Greek noun physis, P-H-Y-S-Y-S-I-S, P-H-Y-S-I-S, which denotes the constitution or form of a person or thing by its nature. So the word species and race, believe it or not, Two words in English in James 3, 7 translate as the same Greek noun, physis, meaning a type or kind of person or thing by its nature. Before Darwinism, the word race used to be used of plants and animals because of types, of kinds. But you see, in wokeness, Race is a mutable, alterable, impermanent social construct. That's why everything now is racist, because it's mutable. The definition changes. A person, to, to discriminate against a person who's overweight is racist now. Although race has nothing to do with poundage. It's got nothing to do with how much you weigh. That's an example that race is a social construct, you see. Even the wokest people on the planet, critical race theorists, have acknowledged the fact that race is merely a social construct and that it has no grounding in biology or science. In the book titled The Handbook of Critical Race Theory and Education, one of today's leading proponents of critical race theory, 
Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings, a professor in the Department of Educational Policy, Policy Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. By the way, the University of Wisconsin-Madison is where critical race theory was born. That is the birthplace of CRT in the summer of 1989 at the University of, of Wisconsin-Madison. But listen to Dr. Gloria Lassen Billings. Again, one of the most ardent proponents of critical race theory you will find in the world. Acknowledge that race is only a social construct. Listen, she writes this, quote, biologists, geneticists, and anthropologists all agree that race is not a scientific reality. Despite what we perceive as phenotypic differences, the scrutiny of a microscope or the sequencing of genes reveals no perceptible differences between what we call races. Let me pause here and say, <clears throat> though Dr. Billings is not a theologian, what she did right there was just give an apologetic for Acts 1726. This is exactly what she just did, though she doesn't realize it. Continuing to quote Dr. Billings, as members of the same species, as members of the same physis, She's exegeting James 3, 7, and she doesn't even realize it. As members of the same species, not races, human beings are biologically quite similar. Thus, while critical race theorists accept the scientific understanding of no race, no genetic difference, we also, here's where the social construct comes in, we also accept the power of a social reality that allows for significant disparities in the life chances of people based on the categorical understanding of race, unquote. Race is a social construct. Even CRTers acknowledge this. There is no such thing as human races. There is only the human species or the human kind, which is comprised and constituted of various ethnicities. As those who are in this world but are, are not of it, that's John 17, 14, we need to unconditionally reject the sociocultural nomenclature of the world and commit ourselves to using biblical terms and biblical categories. You must reject, you must reject the vernacular of the world. Or what I, what I say, I like to say, you must learn to exegete the culture. You must learn to push back at the culture and say when you, well, when you use the word race, what do you mean by that? The proper, meaning biblical term, is ethnicity, not race. Not race. Another example of how wokeness manifests itself as ethnic tribalism is James Galliard, senior pastor at Word Tabernacle Church in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. Shortly after the beating death of 29-year-old Tyree Nichols, a black man on January 8, 2023, at the hands of five black Memphis, Tennessee police officers, the video of which was subsequently released to the public, Pastor Gilliard made the following remarks to his congregation at Word Tabernacle, saying this, quote, I did not personally watch the videos because I needed to be able to preach to y'all without being an angry black man. That one sentence right there, AIG needs to have me back just to talk about that one sentence right there. I did not watch the videos because I needed to be able to preach to y'all without being an angry black man. And so I personally was not able to look at them. What I will tell you is that the answer has always been and always be God using the African American church as an agent of moral and cultural change in our community. It has always been that. It will always be that. And so, and when I say, quote, the African American church, unquote, I'm not talking about a church of only black people. I'm talking about a church that understands, listen to this, I'm talking about a church that understands that the gospel is justification by faith and social justice. And so whether those are black, brown, or white people that embrace that, 
When we embrace that and we give and recognize that we don't live by bread alone, but by our giving, we provide a voice, we provide funding to the voice of change. And so when we don't give, particularly to African-American churches or to churches that believe that the gospel is justification by faith and social justice, when I do not give to those environments, I am perpetuating the Tyree Nichols situations of our society, unquote. He said it quite, twice. Ethnic tribalism. The gospel is not just justification by faith. It's justification by faith and social justice. You see, those words from Pastor Gilliard are an excellent example of what my good friend, Pastor Tom Buck of First Baptist Church in Lindell, Texas, rightly describes as woke hermeneutics. Woke hermeneutics. Listen, when the soteriology to which you profess to subscribe is merely a woke hybrid of sola fide and socialis justitia, or social justice, you don't need a savior. What you need is a social worker. <laughs> you don't need redemption. You need reparations. Perhaps Pastor Gilliard is unfamiliar with what the Apostle Paul unambiguously declares in Galatians 2.16 that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Even if we have believed in Christ so that we may just be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. In other words, Pastor Gellier, no one is justified by social justice. You are not justified by the works of social justice. You are justified alone by faith in Christ. Period. There is no and. Now, I don't know if he would profess to be a believer, but I'm convinced. These words from Dr. Thomas Sowell from his book, The Quest for Cosmic Justice, are nonetheless true for many woke Christians today. Sowell said in that book, quote, Envy was once considered to be one of the seven deadly sins before it became one of the most admired admired virtues under its new name, social justice. Saul is right. You see, the woke hermeneutics of Gilliard, Tisby, and other such propagators of black liberation theology is merely the fruit of generations of ethno-ecclesiastical traditions in which churches with predominantly black congregations have come to view themselves precisely as Dr. Albert J. Roberto says in his book titled Slave Religion, the Invisible Institution of the Antebellum South, where Roberto said that the black church is, quote, an agency of social control, a source of economic cooperation, an arena for political activity, a sponsor of publication, public education, and a refuge in a hostile white world, unquote. That's exactly what ethnic tribalism has reduced the black church to, an agency of social, political, and economic control that it it sees itself as a refuge against white people. But notwithstanding the woke hermeneutics of Gellert and Tisby, one of the more egregious examples of ethnic tribalism can be found in the book titled The The Divided Mind of the Black Church, subtitled Theology, Piety and Public Witness by Reverend Raphael Warnock. Warnock serves as senior pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, and in my opinion, he is the most ardent proponent of black liberation theology in the evangelical church today. In that book that I just cited, Warnock said this, quote, with the encroachment of conservative biblical fundamentalism, by the way, translate translate that as white evangelicalism, With the encroachment of conservative biblical fundamentalism and its authoritative claims to absolute biblical truth, the black church needs, now more than ever, a critical theological principle for probing the meaning of black Christian identity. We're talking about ethnic tribalism here. I submit, still quoting Warnock, I submit that the concerns of the poor and the most marginalized members of the black community and nothing else, and nothing else, So no gospel, only the concerns of the poor and the most marginalized, must be at the center of that much-needed conversation. Absent that serious and sustained conversation, 
black theology has been left without a robust public witness within the very institution that gave birth to its prophetic voice. And the black church has been left without the critical tools necessary for probing the theological meaning of its black identity and what that might mean in this moment for a nation in crisis, unquote. Did you hear those phrases, black Christian identity, black identity? You can't get more tribalist than that. Listen, brothers there and sisters, there is only one church, okay? One. There's only one church. There's no black church. There's no brown church. There's no yellow church. There's no red church. There's only one church. There's only one church of which Christ Jesus himself is the cornerstone and in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in him, that is in Christ, not in Tisby, nor Galliard, nor Warnock, nor Woodley, nor even Harrison, but in Jesus Christ, you are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit, as the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 2. We would all do well to reject the divisiveness of woke hermeneutics and consider what God's Word says in such texts as 2 Corinthians 5.16. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. So when I meet you, you are not my white brother. You're not my white sister. You're not my Hispanic brother, my Latino brother, my Middle Eastern brother. You're my brother or my sister, period. That's 1 Corinthians 12, 18. God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. This is a one-verse apologetic against what Jamar Tisby was arguing, that black people should just leave. When God placed each of us in his church, just as he desired, the verse says. Acts 10, verses 34, 35. Peter declared, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. But in every nation, there's that word again, in every ethnicity, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. So whether viewed through the theological relativism of Dr. Randy Woodley or the ethnic tribalism of James Galliard, Jamar Tisby, and Raphael Warnock, wokeness is a spiritual cancer, which sadly is aggressively metastasizing throughout the evangelical church today. It is a malady which, not unlike cancer, is destroying the church from the inside. You would be shocked, and I mean this, I'm not over-exaggerating. You would be shocked to hear some of the stories shared with me and my Just Thinking ministry partner, Virgil Walker, by fellow believers as we travel across the country, speaking at churches and conferences like this on the subject of biblical ethnicity, some of whom, whom have approached us in tears after having spent literally decades in a local church, but are now having to find themselves searching for a new church home because their former church went woke theolo theologically. As I reflect on those accounts from those people, I'm reminded of these words from the book Heaven Taken by Storm by the 17th century Puritan Thomas Watson who said this, quote, Watson says, error, error is an adultery of the mind. Truth is an antidote against error. The reason so many have been tricked into error is because they either did not know or did not love the truth. I can never say enough in the honor of truth. Truth is basis fide, the ground of our faith. It shows us what we are to believe. Take away truth and our faith is but fancy, Watson said. Wokeness is a deceptive, destructive, demonic mirage in which salvation is disguised as social justice and redemption is camouflaged as reparations. It is a false gospel whose message is built upon the postmodern quicksand of theological relativism and ethnic tribalism. In his sermon titled, The Hallmarks of God's True Church, Pastor John MacArthur said this, quote, this is very important. The worst battles the church fights are not outside, but inside. Because you have people defecting to Satan's agenda. 
It's foundational to the church then to understand that there is a very, very subtle conflict going on all the time. And it isn't that you want to be unloving. It isn't that you want to be a fighter all the time, but it is for the sake of the safety and protection of the church that you have to know what's coming and you have to fight with the weapon of the truth." Unquote. I want to say to you pastors out there who haven't necessarily at this point in your ministry have had to deal with this idea of wokeness, that you haven't had to come face to face with it, but I want to warn you, it is coming. It's coming after your church, it's coming after your school, and it's coming after your place of employment. It is coming. The Apostle Paul urged believers in Ephesus to no longer be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. The word scheming in that verse in Ephesians 4.14 is the Greek noun methodeia. It's where we get our English word methods. So in that verse, Paul is talking about the erroneous methods, the erroneous tactics, the demonic strategies designed to deliberately lead others astray. We are not to be captivated by those. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2.11 that we are not to be ignorant of Satan's schemes. Consider that apostolic injunction in light of what the 17th century Puritan Thomas Brooks says in his book, Precious Remedies Against Satan Devices, wherein Brooks says that the primary device Satan uses against believers in Christ is to present the bait and hide the hook. Satan tries to present the bait but hide the hook. That's how you catch the fish. The fish doesn't see the hook. All he sees is the bait. That is precisely what wokeness in all its spiritual deceptiveness does. It presents the bait of unity, justice, and equity while hiding the hook of division, partiality, hatred, envy, jealousy, and covetousness. As my friend John Benzinger, who pastors at Redeemer Bible Church in Gilbert, Arizona, writes in his book titled Stand, Christianity versus Social Justice, quote, the social justice movement is not Christianity. The message, the methods, the mission, the desired outcomes are not Christian. It is as anti-Christian, it is an anti-Christian philosophy disguised as truth and love that has captured much of the visible church. It is a foreign antibody injected into the body of Christ. The social justice, justice movement is poisoning the church, spreading strife and attacking the very heart of the gospel." Unquote. Now, when wokeness comes for your church, I alluded to this a second ago, when wokeness comes for your church, and notice I said when, not if, what are you going to do? How are you going to respond? Are you going to stand firm on the sufficiency of Scripture, or are you going to cave and bend the knee to the woke mob, a mob which very likely will arise from inside your own congregation? Are you going to cave for fear that you'll lose some of your members to a quiet exodus, or perhaps worse, who will attempt to force you out of your church altogether because you refused to morph into Martin Luther King Jr. on Sunday morning? Are you going to cave because you get criticism that you didn't use your pulpit as a woke soapbox? Now, as I close, my call to action to you and to me as we toil together in the power of the Holy Spirit, to as the Apostle Paul exhorts us in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, destroy speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God is simply this. My charge to you is this, keep the main thing the main thing. Keep the main thing the main thing. I say that in light of what Jesus said to his disciples in Mark chapter 1, verse 38. Jesus said, let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is why I came. Jesus came to preach the gospel. He kept the main thing, the main thing. J.C. Ryle put it this way in his book, 
expository thoughts on the Gospel of John, and with these words I will close. J.C. Ryle said, quote, Do we do any work for God? Do we try, however feebly, to set forth his cause on earth, to check that which is evil, to promote that which is good? If we do, let us never be ashamed of doing it with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. The world may mock and sneer and call us fundamentalists, but let us work on unmoved. Whatever men may say and think, we are walking in the steps of our Lord Jesus." Unquote. I echo that exhortation from J.C. Ryle. Let us walk on unmoved. And if I may be so bold, let us not only work on unmoved, but let us also work on unwoke. Thank you very much.